Welcome back to TechNet Radio. The Microsoft Exchange team kicks off their new series covering all things Exchange Server 2013. And in today's episode, Ann Vu, Ross Smith, Jeff Meliff, and Todd Luton discuss the most frequently asked Exchange 2013 architecture questions. Tune in as they chat about key version differences, load balancing, database limit per mailbox changes, and much, much more. And the mic is yours. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Exchange Ideas, a new Exchange TechNet radio webcast series. So I am joined by Ross Smith, uh, Jeff, and Todd, and we're here to talk about Exchange Server 2013 architecture. Essentially, all the questions you've wanted to know about Exchange Server 2013 architecture, but were too afraid to ask or have already asked and haven't gotten an answer yet. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, first I wanted to talk to all of these three fine gentlemen and ask how has the new Exchange Server 2013 architecture changed from some of our previous server versions? Sure. Um... Well, we've moved from five server roles to two specific server roles, uh, the client access server role and the mailbox server role. Uh, both have changed uh, fundamentally from the past two releases. The client access server role is now simply a authentication proxy and redirection server and is completely stateless from a protocol session perspective. And then the mailbox server role, which does the storage of mailbox-related data, but also does processing uh, and rendering for all client connectivity and transport-related functions and unified messaging. I think it's regarding the mailbox storage within the mailbox role. We've uh, implemented a new implementation of the Microsoft Exchange Information Store uh, based entirely on a managed code base, and it's broken into multiple processes from the previously implemented single process model that existed in previous releases. One of the great benefits around the uh, reduction in, in server roles is actually uh, simplification of deployment and scale. Uh, we think that the, the mailbox role and uh, the CAS role are actually great uh, units of scale that can be deployed um, uh, you know, very, very easily from uh, both a, a large scale deployment like what we uh, run in Exchange Online as well as a, uh, a much smaller scale deployment uh, and a, a smaller medium business um, and everything in between. Uh, it's very, very much aligned with some of the, the goals that we've had um, in, in prior releases and I think it's a, um, it's a good implementation of, of where we were headed over the past couple of releases towards um, consolidating and uh, getting better utilization of hardware. Okay, so aside from scale, better scale, um, scaling up and scaling down, what are other benefits for customers? Well, the new, the, the new client access server role allows us to move away from complicated session affinity load balancing solutions to um, and ultimately simplifying the network stack as we will manage session affinity at the client access server role now specifically, which enables us to, to do other things in the in the network stack, we can potentially uh, simplify the namespaces in the architecture and reduce the number of namespaces we need in a site resilience scenario. Um, we can also manage um, manage the server roles now more independently than we could in the past. From an upgrade perspective, we don't necessarily need to deploy. Uh, in a specific order any longer, like deploying a cumulative update on client access before we deploy it on the mailbox server. So we have some benefits there. Okay, you mentioned we don't need affinity for load balancing anymore. So what does that is exactly mean for customers? I can take that. So that's actually a key point, and there's been a lot of confusion around that. Um, and talking to customers and partners over the last uh, last few months since we released Exchange 2013. So. Because of the fact that the mailbox role in Exchange 2013 handles all uh, processing and rendering of um, any sort of, uh, of of client access from a user, uh, and that um, that processing will always occur on the same mailbox server for a given user, we no longer have to have a load balancer sitting in front of the Exchange infrastructure that is constantly uh, managing all of that traffic and ensuring that every request for a given user goes to a particular server. Exchange just handles that itself with, with this new architectural change. 
So the, the key benefit there um, is a reduction in complexity uh, and a reduction in uh, required processing power at that load balancer level. So we think customers can actually deploy uh, simpler, cheaper load balancing implementations, save some cost. Uh, if they've already made an investment uh, in load balancing technology, maybe scale that up even higher. Uh, we know that you know load balancing was certainly a requirement for Exchange 2010 to provide high availability, and many of our customers deployed um, you know, very complex, uh, in some cases very expensive uh, pieces of infrastructure there. That can absolutely be reused with 2013, but we think that um, that uh, with that, that simplification, uh, that, uh, that that same infrastructure can scale even higher or potentially be reused for, uh, for other workloads as well. Well, that sounds like a great option. So um, I hear that as part of the new architectural changes, that we're no longer supporting uh, RPC over TCP, and that we're only using RPC over HTTPS or Outlook anywhere. So what's the impact of doing this? Well, the I guess I'll start with the benefit. The benefit is that we're moving towards what, and this ties back to the architectural changes. We're moving towards a more stable and reliable and, and predictable connectivity models for clients. Um, when we looked at, at this new model with moving, we essentially moved the RPC client access service back to the mailbox server role because the client access server is no longer doing any data rendering uh, or data transformation. It's simply proxying the connection to the mailbox server that's hosting the active database copy. So as a result of that type of shift, that meant we needed either an additional namespace for the, the database availability group or the mailbox server in and of itself to handle that RPC client access processing, or it meant that we needed to uh, leverage the server fully qualified domain name. Either one of those scenarios just adds additional complexity to the environment. The first scenario means you need another namespace to manage. The second scenario means that every time a, a database failover occurred or a database switchover occurred, the end user would be prompted to restart the Outlook client. So we wanted to move away from these type of conditions that would trigger an unhealthy ex end user experience. So we moved, uh, we, we considered to move to the RPC HTTP model or the Outlook Anywhere model so that we could have uh, a consistent protocol uh, used between the client accessor, between the client to the CAS and then client to mailbox. Uh, you know, if it's, Regardless, if it's, an inter, if it's an internet client, ActiveSync, Outlook Anywhere, um, OWA, Exchange, Admin Center, it's all going to use HTTP as the protocol to the CAS. CAS will then proxy that session to the mailbox server using HTTP as well. So now we're getting, we've moved away from RPC as the communication pathway between CAS and mailbox, which means that we're now more tolerant to network blips, throughput, utilization, um, latency, and so forth. We can handle all those a lot better. It also means that we got rid of a namespace, because we don't need a, a specific namespace for the DAG anymore. Uh, the way we address that is we no longer leverage a fully qualified domain name in the client. We've now leveraged the, uh, the mailbox GUID with a uh, domain identifier. Uh, so that way, no matter what, the names, the, the, the RPC endpoint for the client is always the same. Failovers don't trigger a client restart. Moving the mailbox won't trigger a client restart. Um, public folders won't trigger a client restart. Um, so we have a much healthier uh, client experience as a result of this. And because we now have uh, the same protocols used for proxying the traffic between CAS and mailbox, we have a much more stable and reliable connectivity experience. Well, that sounds great. So guys, uh, a question that I get from customers pretty often is that the database limit per mailbox server used to be 100 databases a mailbox. But now with Exchange Server 2013, it is now 50 databases a mailbox. So what gives? You know, with the development of Exchange 2013, uh, one of the, the hardware trends that we saw were increasing drive sizes or drive capacities. And we felt that 50 databases with larger drives would give us the capability to support the increasing size of mailboxes um, 
as people start to offer larger mailbox quotas with their mailboxes. Uh, some of the short-term constraints of database uh, size and the size of drives uh, leads us to have a constraint currently. We're uh, always evaluating on ways that we can uh, reduce the overall server TCO and improve scalability, and uh, we'll be constantly evaluating opportunities in which we can do so. Okay. Another question that I get from customers pretty often is, what happened to Edge server? So is, is Edge going away, or what's up with that? The Edge transport role is still a viable uh a viable server role that you can deploy to provide a level of protection between the internet and the exchange organization. Uh, currently with uh, the RTM release of Exchange 2013, we did not release an edge transport server role. Uh, however, uh, both the Exchange 2007 and Exchange 2010 edge transport server roles can be used in conjunction with an Exchange 2013 environment to provide you that, that additional layer of protection. Okay, awesome. And as customers, um, so Exchange Server uh, 2010 SP3 just got released, and as customers are thinking about upgrading to Exchange Server 2013, how does the new architecture impact coexistence, or what are some of the benefits of the new architecture with future coexistence? We've greatly simplified the coexistence story moving forward because the way we've architected the client access server role in Exchange 2013 is so that a the client since the client access server role is simply a proxy and authentication type of server, it can proxy requests to up-level versions of the mailbox server and even down-level versions of the mailbox server. Now, from what this means in terms of coexistence with Exchange 2010, well, we can proxy all those requests whether it's an OA request, an Outlook Anywhere request, Active Sync, uh, web services, uh, to the Exchange 2010 client access server role. So we don't need additional namespaces with uh, Exchange 2010 coexistence. Um, so it's a greatly simplified experience when compared to the Exchange 2010 to uh, and Exchange 2007 coexistence story, or the Exchange 2010, Exchange 2003 coexistence story, where you needed a legacy namespace for o support for OWA. However, uh, the story with Exchange 2007 and Exchange, 2010, uh, Exchange 2013 is a little more complex. We actually do require a, a legacy namespace uh, for the OWA uh, coexistence as well as a specific roll-up. You need Exchange 2007 Service Pack 3 Roll-Up 10 to be deployed across the entire 2007 environment uh, in order to coexist with Exchange 2013. Um, but moving forward, the coexistence story will be much simpler as a result of the new architecture. OK, awesome. And just because I'm curious, what's a feature of the new Exchange server that all of you guys really love? Anyone can go here. One of my personal favorites is the new Outlook web app. And uh, it kind of highlights the work that we've done within the information store in Exchange 2013 and being able to render these much richer views on data uh, and provide a much more uh, usable interface for triaging mail. I'm a big fan of managed availability. Um, you know, the, the more automation we can build into the product to make it uh, stay up and running, keep up and running on its own without operator intervention. Uh, that's all goodness for, for all of our IT pros as well as end users. And that's a great story of how um, investments in the cloud have accrued back to on-prem, correct? Absolutely. Ross, what do you love? Whatever you got so, to touch. <laughs> one of the operational features that I like uh, is our new auto receipt capability from a high availability perspective. The ability for us to detect that a disk failure has occurred and to initiate a the activation of an online spare and then the receipt of all database copies to that uh, the re to that new disk, thus minimizing the operational overhead of an admin having to go and and online that spare and to initiate a manual receipt. I think that's a great feature for the JBOD and and or RAID uh, environments that are out there. Okay, that's awesome. So uh, thanks to all of you guys for talking about uh, 
Exchange Server 2013 architecture and some of the frequently asked architecture questions. So in, in an upcoming uh, video podcast, we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit more about architecture and what customers should start to think about for planning their new environments. So thanks again uh, to Jeff, Ross, and Todd.